You know, so, I mean, I grew up here. I'm from here. And you know my last name, Bunting. You might know my dad, Bob Bunting. The Woodsby softball field's named after him. My mom, Becky Bunting. For those who probably at least in their 30s might remember my mom being in charge of all the swimming lessons and being assistant manager and manager at the swimming pool and even worked at the middle school some. And so, yeah, this place is a big part of me. Being here at CBC, I started actually coming to CBC when I'd be home from break from college and I started taking my faith seriously. I grew, oh well, maybe one I should say I recommitted my life to Christ and really wanting to live my life for Christ. Um, and I think the first few times we were at the middle school auditorium, which is now the First Street Building Auditorium, when I was first coming the first few times. <laughs> I bet you a few nods, oh yeah, I remember that place. That was a long time ago. All right, um, so anyway, yeah, it's, it's always great and a privilege to be here and you know, just reflecting on all kinds of things and because of God and what he's doing in me that I'm able to be here today some of you, if you know me when I was growing up, probably wouldn't have thought I'd be up here today doing this stuff. So anyway, um, yeah, that's uh, just a, a little bit more on my background. But Gospel of John, so glad you guys are going through that. Um, and uh, I was able to, I was here a couple weeks ago, and then I had to go back to Orlando to work in some programs I work with orientation of new people at Wycliffe so they get to understand Wycliffe better and what it means that they're going to be missionaries and all of that and then training people who are going to go out and work with missionary kids and teaching and so I did two programs these last two weeks so um, knowing I was going to do this I'm like really cluing in so the first sermon series I heard in this was Lonnie's Lonnie great job by the way it was awesome and um, uh, and then I, I go to watch the rest of these videos as we come up I watch all the recordings. I'm like, eh, there's not that many. I got to watch. And then I go on and all of a sudden, what? It started in John 20? That's a whole extra one I got to watch. And, then, <laughs> and so anyway, so I'm, I'm watching them all. And, and, and I started thinking, I want to review quick. But I'm like, I want to come up with these one-word reviews, which I didn't actually hold to. But one-word reviews for each one. So the first one, which Brandon preached on, out of John 20, on why this was written, is that we need, that we might believe. But are we really, truly believing? Brandon, and so like, so my brain's scattering a little bit, I just want to say this, is that Brandon's saying, you guys are going to be in this for quite some time, and then somewhere in there he also talked about, I think this was written in AD 68, I didn't back it up to verify that or go back and look at it, but um, anyway, so I had that in my mind. And we keep going along. And the next one is the idea of, and I said, renew every day. It's the idea that we need Jesus every day in our lives, have the logos, the word in our lives each day. And then Lonnie spoke on the light and how much we need to receive the true light. And it needs to be in us. And then Dennis um, spoke about recognizing Jesus in our lives and, and he had like six words out of the Gospel of John or something like that and did a whole sermon and I was super impressed by that and Dennis I also love the challenge that you gave I don't, I don't think I've seen you here today but if you're watching um, anyway I was really impressed by that and then I thought man it's going to take 68 years to get through this because I went back to that 68 which is why I brought up the 68 AD and I was like it's going to take forever if they keep cutting it down that small anyway sorry my random thoughts as I'm getting caught up on what's going on, right? And I'm watching this all in the last two weeks, right? And then, uh, and then last, last week, Brandon talked about grace. It's nothing of ourselves. It's all about what Jesus is doing in us. And so that's our background as we go into this. And so this is all of John's introduction. And then we get into the start of everything, and we start looking at John the Baptist. And that's today, and what John the Baptist had for his ministry. Actually, before I read this, I have one story I want to tell you. Um, I'll let you see the review slide so you don't get distracted by the passage. Um, 
in the Philippines, there are some people who, as you look at this review, because this goes with the review, they're not understanding this whole concept of what we're seeing in John and believing in a works-based faith. They're not, the, the Philippines is majority a Catholic nation, but they, they, they don't even necessarily listen to everything the priests tell them. So this practice that some of these Catholics are doing, the Catholic priests are saying, stop, but they keep doing it. And, um, and what it is in this particular region on Easter weekend, Easter weekend is like the biggest holiday season in all of the Philippines. By the way, we served in the Philippines. I was there 15 years, or yeah, 15 years. Met my wife, Valerie, there. She was there 12 years. And in this area, what they do on Good Friday, a lot of people, they put some sort of a, it's kind of like a, a hood they put over their face so you can't see them, but they can see everything. And they're walking around. They put some cuts in their back and they take this flagellation thing and they go like this. And because of the cuts in the back, that would start hurting. And, and it starts opening the wounds a little bit more. Um, right now it can feel like a nice massage, but my back feels good. So, um, but that's what, that's what they're doing. And they're going around and sometimes, and as I was going around to see this, I'd see this guy like hand out a leather belt and then lay on the ground like he'd get some kid to beat him. And so the kids are like, bam, bam, just beating them. And then later in the day, there's these multiple places in town that they're playing out the passion play or however you want to we call it the passion play a lot of times it's the idea of jesus's trial and then crucifixion and so they do it and then when they get to the crucifixion place there's a big one that makes like world news sometimes and they're in a parade and they go up and they have this crucifixion and they have three crosses and they actually put nails in their hands sometimes it's in the middle the one I saw, there's these little neighborhood ones too. They have their crucifixions, like, like they're, they're really proud they have these little neighborhood ones and the guy just had it right here. But it's still, a nail went through. And in that, the people who are doing the flagellation, the people who are doing the crucifixion things, one of the things they do is that they believe because of their suffering, God will be forgiving them of their sins and their family's sins because they're doing this great and honorable thing for God. This is not a great and honorable thing. This is ignoring the grace that Brandon was talking about last week, what Jesus did for us. Because they don't really know what God is saying. They don't really know what's in the Bible. They might be going to Catholic masses, but they're not reading the Bible for themselves. I'm sure there's some scripture that they get from the Catholic mass. I don't know how much they're paying attention to it because they're definitely not listening to the priests when they say, don't do this stuff anymore. And it made me think, how much do we have that in our lives sometimes? Might not be as big and huge as that. But I say all this to kind of keep it in mind as we keep going through this passage, be thinking about that. So now we'll look at, take a look at what our actual passage is today out of John 1, 19 through 22. And I, I would encourage you, if you do have a Bible, if you open up to this, because at later points I'll refer back to it, but I won't have it back up on a slide. I just decided I didn't want to make a ton of slides and keep putting scripture back up there for whatever reason. So anyway, just know that it might be helpful if you want to look back at it as I refer back to those passages later. And this is the testimony of John. When the Jews sent priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask him, who are you? He confessed and did not deny, but confessed, I am not the Christ. And they asked him, what then? Are you Elijah? He said, I am not. Are you the prophet? And he answered, no. So they said to them, who are you? We need to give an answer to those who sent us. 
what do you say about yourself? And he said, I am the voice of one crying out in the wilderness. Make straight the way of the Lord, as the prophet Isaiah said. Now, they had been sent from the Pharisees. They asked him, oh, I didn't bring us a slide. I advanced my paper, but I missed a slide. Now, they had been sent from the Pharisees. They asked him, then why are you baptizing? If you are neither the Christ, nor Elijah, nor the prophet, John answered them, I baptize with water, but among you stands one you do not know, even he who comes after me, the strap of whose sandal I am not worthy to untie. These things took place in Bethany across the Jordan where John was baptizing. The next day he saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is he of whom I said, after me comes a man who ranks before me because he was before me. This was pity realizing John's actually older than Jesus. So anyway, it's not hitting me this morning. I'm just realizing that. Anyway, just wanted to share my little thoughts. Okay. I myself did not know him, but for this purpose, I came baptizing with water that he might be revealed to Israel. And John bore witness. I saw the spirit descend from heaven like a dove, and it remained on him. I myself do not know him, but he who sent me to baptize with water said to me, he on whom you see the spirit descend and remain, this is he who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. And I have seen and have borne witness that this is the Son of God. By the way, that little bit that hit me and I just pointed out, that's also in review summary. All right. The whole idea that Jesus always was because he was the word. He's our creator. So who is John the Baptist? The Pharisees or the people coming from the Pharisees that's, we're thinking he's the Christ or the Messiah. They've been waiting for the Messiah forever. Our first passage for the Messiah is Genesis 3. That's a long time of the Old Testament where there's references and waiting for Jesus to come. And they are expectantly waiting and hoping and hoping the Messiah and what they're hoping for a Messiah. There's multiple Messiah figures through the Old Testament and they think they were all going to be separate people. The one they want is the one that's going to come in and be king and overthrow Rome. And that's what everybody is hoping for. And so John's getting this gathering and John says, nope, I'm not the Messiah. But they were thinking it because John's teaching was new. It was gaining a following. It was different. He was doing some strange things that were a little different. And so, are you the Messiah? No, I am not. Are you Elijah? That comes from Malachi 4, 5 through 6. Here's the Malachi passage. Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the great and awesome day of the Lord comes. And he will turn the hearts of fathers in their, to their children and the hearts of children to their fathers, lest I come and strike the land with a decree of utter destruction. So this is the last, in, in Old Testament scriptures, this is the last prophet that we have written in the scriptures and talking about Elijah coming now, they expect an actual, real, physical Elijah to come because if you know your Old Testament stories, Elijah was a prophet in the days of the kings of Israel and he kept talking about all the evils they would do and Elijah was close with God and as he's getting ready to leave, God sends a chariot of fire to come and pick up Elijah. Elijah gets in it, goes up in this chariot of fire. The only person to see it is his disciple Elisha who then takes over his ministry and so Elijah didn't die he just 
went on up into heaven. So Jews still today are waiting for Elijah to come back to be, this prede- to be the predecessor for the Messiah to come. And when they celebrate the Passover, they have an empty chair at the table for Elijah in case he comes to eat with them. So, they really think Elijah's going to come. And John says, no, I'm not Elijah. However, what he is being, he is an Elijah-like figure. Turning the hearts, getting people to turn their hearts to be ready for the Messiah. He is a predecessor for the Messiah. But John I suspect, is also thinking, Elijah's actually going to come. John might actually think there's going to be these multiple messiahs as well. But repentance is needing to happen. And John is wanting people to have that. So, Jesus, Jesus in Matthew 11, 14, This is where it would have been good if I would have put this scripture out. I wouldn't have had to put my glasses on. Um, he says, well, starting back 13, for all the law and the prof- all the prophets and the law prophesied until John. And if you are willing to accept it, he is the Elijah who was to come. And so Jesus is saying, John is that Elijah that Malachi was talking about. Because Jesus is the Messiah. He is that. It didn't have to be the actual physical Elijah, but someone who is that Elijah, who is that prophet to do that. So John is saying, I am not Elijah. Jesus is correcting him. Jesus, who is God, has the right to correct John. Now, he didn't get to correct John. He corrected some thinking and saying, John is that Elijah we were waiting for. But they say, okay, you're not Elijah. Are you the prophet? Are you the prophet? Are you the prophet? Well, the prophet comes in Deuteronomy 18, 15 through 18. Moses writing to the people of Israel. The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among you, from your brothers, It is to him you shall listen, just as you desired of the Lord your God at Horeb on the day of the assembly, when you said, let me not hear again the voice of the Lord my God, or see this great fire any more, lest I die. And the Lord said to me, they are right in what they have spoken. I will raise up for them a prophet like you from among their brothers, and I will put my words in his mouth, and he shall speak to them all that I command. And John says, I'm not that prophet. I'm not that person either. And the reality is, Jesus is more of who this prophet is, another Messiah-like figure. So the prophet is supposed to be someone who's like Moses. You must listen to him. Now, I think there's a lot of debates on who this prophet is supposed to be. Maybe John the Baptist really is supposed to be this prophet because you need to listen to John and the message that he has. It is really significant. You're like, who are you then if you're none of those things? John said, I am the voice out in the world, calling out in the wilderness. Isaiah 40, verses 3 and 5. It says, A voice cries in the wilderness, Prepare the way of the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. And the glory of the Lord shall be revealed, and all flesh shall see it together. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken. Preparing the way of the Lord. And 
I put in there in my notes, today's, that means Jesus. We know that. John felt like that was leading to the Messiah. And through this, the glory of the Lord will be revealed. John knows his role. If you really want to get into scriptures, the messy part is, did he fill some of these other roles too? Yes. And we have all this kind of stuff, and we really get into scripture studies. It kind of gets crazy in how much this and this and this points to this and this and this. And when the people who got those didn't really know how they would point to all those things. But they knew they had somebody to be looking for in their Messiah Christ like figure. So now to look at what is John's actual message. And so his first part is repent. And they're like, these leaders are like, why are you doing baptisms for Jewish people? Baptism in that day was supposed to be for converts, people coming into Judaism. They get baptized, which represents dying to your old self and coming anew, just like we do it today. But for them, it meant coming into Judaism and they were going to put away all their idols, put away all of that and come and worship the one true creator God and be with the Jews and hope for the Messiah who is yet to come. And that's what you're doing when you do the baptism. But that's not what John was doing. He was baptizing Jewish people. The only time Jewish people would be baptized is if they kind of wandered away from the faith and now they're coming back to the faith. And now they need to be baptized. And by the way, for Jewish people, when you wander away from the faith, that means you're wandering away from your people. You're going to another nation. You've actually left your people for a while. Now you're coming back. You're repenting. You're changing heart. You're saying, I need to be back in fellowship with God. And so that is what it was for Jewish people. But John wasn't doing that either. And so... John is actually having people repent from their lives and for Jewish people who are with the Jewish nation who are not following God. You need to repent and be ready because the Messiah is coming. Someone who we, who we see in the later part of the passage, he's not worthy to untie his sandals and wash his feet. By the way, the lowliest servant is the person who would untie the sandals of someone else to wash their feet. Actually, I don't think the passage said wash feet. But anyway, but that's what would be referring to. He's the lowliest servant in the household because it was kind of a gross job. And as he's talking to these Jewish leaders, they're too proud of their position of leadership to even submit to the idea that they might have to repent. They don't really like John's message, but John is gaining a huge following. Some can say disciples. So, repentance. And with that, this big thing that's happening is there's going to be reform. So not only repentance, admitting where you've got your wrong, but reform means I'm willing to start changing. I'm willing to start doing something else. So we're getting ready. We see that Messiah. The one who comes after me, the strap of whose sandal I'm not worthy to untie. The next day he saw, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. You need to get yourself ready for him. We need to change what we're doing in life. I felt like what Dennis was sharing 
I mean, how much do we see ourselves as God sees us to reform our ways to live in the way that God sees us? Sometimes we see ourselves not through God's eyes, but through other people's eyes or what we perceive to be other people's eyes, which is not rooted in truth. And we need to start that reformation in our lives. Next part. Reveal the Lamb of God. That's what he's here to do. Reveal the Lamb of God. And he calls him the Lamb. There was nothing great about lambs. Lambs just, you know, they just follow. They just trust. There's nothing like, yay, there's a lamb. However, the lamb goes back to the idea of the Passover lamb. The lamb is also a part of sacrifices. That Passover lamb when they were in Egypt, had to be slaughtered. Blood had to be put on the doorpost. So as the angel of death is coming through Egypt, does not kill the firstborn of the Israelites. And actually, any Egyptian could have done this too, and the angel of death would not have killed any of the Egyptians. But the Egyptians didn't do this. And so then, you have that Passover happening, and the whole thing, they eat the Passover lamb, all of that that happens with the lamb, it gets roasted on fire and all of that. And they celebrate this, and they do this every year in remembrance of leaving Egypt as slaves. But the other thing the lamb does, the Passover lamb, it covers your sin. That's why the angel of death didn't hit the guy. And as they built in the sacrificial system, as part of the sacrifice of forgiveness of sin. And they know that with the lamb. John goes on to say um, how he saw the Holy Spirit descend on him when he baptized him, which we see that in the other Gospels. John baptized Jesus. He tells Jesus, I shouldn't be doing that. You should baptize me. And Jesus says, right now, you need to baptize me. As Jesus sets the example for what he knew was coming. And when John does that, he sees the Holy Spirit descending on him like a dove. And he also hears a voice telling him how he is loved of God. And this Holy Spirit is a gift for anyone. Because Jesus comes to baptize with the Holy Spirit. Prior to Jesus, the Holy Spirit was given to people for certain purposes so that they would be able to go out in God's strength and be able to go out in God's power and be able to go out, I would also say, in God's wisdom if the Spirit was within them. They were for a time and for a purpose and maybe for the rest of that person's life, but it was not a representation of salvation. Now, as as Jesus baptizes with the Holy Spirit, we don't do that. We still baptize with water to represent that change in life. But Jesus is the one that gives out the Holy Spirit. None of us ever saves anybody. We don't do that. Jesus does that. Through the gift of the Holy Spirit. And he did it through his death and suffering. This also is a, goes to Isaiah 53. 4 through 12. And 
Moses is thinking, oh, why is this history? Isaiah 53, he's saying his history. He says, surely he took up our infirmities and carried our sorrows, yet we considered him stricken by God, smitten by him and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him, and by his wound we are healed. We all, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him all the iniquity of us all. Yet he was oppressed and afflicted, and yet he did not open his mouth. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter, as a sheep before the shearers is silent. He did not open his mouth. By oppression and judgment he was taken away. And who can speak of his descendants? For he was cut off from the land of the living. For the transgression of my people he was stricken. He was assigned to a grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death. He had done, though he had done no violence, nor was there any deceit in his mouth. Yet it was the Lord's will to crush him and cause him to suffer. And though the Lord makes his life a guilt offering, he will see to his offering and prolong his days. And the will of the Lord will prosper in his hand. After the suffering of his soul, he will see the light of life and be satisfied. By his knowledge, my righteous servant will justify many, and he will bear their iniquities. Therefore, I will give him a portion among the great, and he will divide the spoils of the strong. And because he poured his, out his life into death and was numbered with the transgressors, for he bore the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors. That is what Jesus did. He became a Passover lamb. This was done at Passover time when Jesus died. And if you look at crucifixion accounts, you will see Isaiah 53 matches a lot of what Jesus went through in his trial and crucifixion. And it resembles Jesus so much that today Jewish people hardly ever look at Isaiah 53. it points to Jesus but also at the same time it's not the Messiah figure everyone was looking for a suffering servant it's in the scriptures so John is helping reveal and pointing to Jesus he's helping us get our, our stuff figured out helping us get ourselves straightened out what are things that are keeping us from living for Jesus? What's in our way? I guarantee you all of us have something in the way that actually keeps us from being devoted to Christ 100%. Because we still have sin within us. We need to make some changes. What I love about um, Dennis's message was just talking about what he was seriously dealing with even while he was a missionary in Turkey. That was awesome. Because we all have that stuff to deal with. We all have to figure out who we are in Christ and how much Christ loves us and cares for us. So what now? We follow John's message. We need to repent. It's not just a one-time repentance. We often need to repent for the things that we are not following Christ in the way that we should. We need to get our hearts in a proper place. In fact, worship on Sunday can be that much more impactful for us if our heart is in the proper place, if we come ready to worship. And I'll be the first to confess, I don't really spend a whole lot of time on a Sunday morning getting my heart in a place to worship before I come to church. Since I was up here, this is probably one of the best days I've done this in a long time. And I still don't think I did it to the best that I could probably could. We were born to be ready for change. How can you grow in your discipleship? What are things that you can do to grow and get stronger and grow closer to Christ? We need to daily be in Jesus. That was one of our past messages. Are we in the word, the logos? 
Maybe we need to grow in prayer. Maybe we need to be intentionally getting together with others that is going to help us grow closer to Christ. Maybe that's in a small group. Maybe that's a one-on-one relationship with someone who will hold us accountable or help us to just stay focused on Christ. Bottom line is, we just need to take action and do something rather than just sitting there. And rather than just going through the motions we always keep going through every day, probably shouldn't say sitting there because we're always doing a lot of things, right? But we need to do something else. I want to share a story about the impact of Scripture because I said that's the first thing, and we've been talking about the logos and being in the Word. I don't, and being from Wycliffe Bible Translators, I want you to understand the impact of being in the Word on a regular basis. I know a number of people, that's a biggest struggle. And if you don't like the version you have, you don't like using the ESV that gets used for preaching at the church, get a different version to read. So, anyway, here we go. Here's our story. It took 15 years to translate the New Testament for the Gehuku people of Papua New Guinea. After all that time, there were only two believers kind of disappointing 15 years man each week a translation worker took copies of the new testament to the market town near gahuku people but not many were interested one saturday however a gahuku woman thanked the worker for helping translate the new testament into her language she told him there was a school teacher from another area and said one day i was in a bookstore and picked up a book i was shocked to see it was in my language i had never seen anything written in my language before It was the Gehuku New Testament. She said she started reading it and couldn't put it down. While I read it, the Spirit of God came over me, and I knew I was different. Her New Testament was nearly worn out with use. She told how she began reading it to others, and the Spirit came over them, too. When asked how the people became believers because of her reading, she answered, There must be at least 200. All from reading the scripture. And by the way, they had trade languages and other languages. A lot of people in the rest of the world speak more than one language. Language they understand, probably majority language. They can understand the scripture, but they don't really get it. What, God speaks my language? God actually cares about me because he speaks my language? we share about the land that's another thing how do we help reveal it's my last what now how do we help others grow one of the things that can help you grow can also help someone else grow and that was that idea of getting together with other people and together we can be growing together so that's an amazing way to help others grow in their discipleship and we're talking about how we are revealing the lamb so others can hear it for the first time. That's what missions is about. We just sent off four kids to start learning that process in a short-term missions trip. My prayer for them is that that would impact them the rest of their lives, that they will want to be able to taste the lamb to the rest of the world. And the thing is, people need to have that scripture. It all comes back to it. If we really want to grow in Christ, we need to have scripture that we understand. So here's a, another story we have. It came from the Philippines. A short-term missionary to the Philippines 
asked the Bible translator why his village didn't have a building like the identical church building she saw in each village on her way to her assignment. By the way, there is, there is a group in the Philippines. They are not Christians, but there is identical church buildings, and there's different colors on the buildings, and that's the only thing that's different all across the Philippines. They even have Christ in the name, Iglesia Ni Cristo. Years ago, he states, he explains, missionaries established churches in many villages and eventually handed them over to local leadership. A little while later, a group spreading a false gospel began teaching lies, and many in the village churches believed them. They thought they must have misunderstood what the first missionaries had taught them. Since they didn't have scripture in their language, they only had to rely on what others told them. But no false church existed in their village because the Bible translators worked there first. When the group started preaching the false gospel, the people pulled out the scriptures in their language and checked out whether the new teaching was true. When they saw it wasn't true, they sent the false teachers away. If we know what's in here, because we're in it, the falsehoods that come up in life we can refute it. But if we're not in it, it's a hard time to refute it. And it allows other things to come in our lives. Diano, this is also in the Philippines, by the way, Diano, he's a man from a Cuenca tribe. He was helping out a translator work on the New Testament. And the translator asked Giano, hey, when you see something, you start believing and seeing it. In my country, people like need to see proof before they start believing. Why is that? And Giano was shocked that that was an issue. He said, if I wake up in the middle of the night in my house, it's pitch black, after I, and I can't see anything. I have to feel around on the floor with my hands until I find a kerosene lamp and a match to light the lamp. The kerosene comes up the wick and burns so I can see what I want. And it's light all around. As we've been doing the translation, it's as if somebody has lit a lamp inside my heart for the first time, I see and understand who God is. Why wouldn't I believe it? So my challenge in the end is let's not be like the group who's not listening to their church leaders, who's beating themselves, going off with a tradition that does not bring them to Christ, does not bring them to salvation, does not bring them closer to God. Let's follow God's kingdom. It's different than any worldly kingdom or nation. But what needs to be a priority in our lives? The priority in our lives needs to be to know him, to live for him, and to share that with others. Everything else should be a means to spread his glory. As he lives through us, as by magnifying. I'm like, what does that mean? It's a lot of little things. I looked it up real quick, right? Magnify, like a hundred times. Like when people see me, they see Jesus a hundred times. And I want you to know, I said, find a version you want. There's a lot of people who don't even have a version to help them understand. And how it's spreading. Why can't we do it real quick? 
documented. We partner with other organizations. Other organizations like Jesus Film will take the Gospel of Luke and make Jesus Film. And then people come to Christ because of that film. And then people start planting churches or the churches are already there, but people aren't really growing and the churches aren't really growing and they get the scripture and then the churches start growing because of the stories I just read. And it's all in the Bible. So let's see what we can do to start coming together and challenging each other. Let me pray. Lord, I thank you for the message of John the Baptist to prepare the way for you, our Savior. That it comes first with a change in our lives, a repentance, a recognizing where we're wrong, a recognizing where we need change. And Lord, and also a recognition that until we join you in heaven, we have needs that we need to grow closer to you and need to make those changes in our lives. Lord, we ask that you speak to each one of our hearts and give us the humility to make those changes and not just be like the Pharisees who didn't want to be baptized by John and make those changes, but to do that and be bold in that. Give us that boldness to make that change, Lord. We pray in your name. May the blood of Christ wash over you and make you fresh. And may his word be a light to your feet, a light to your path, and give you life. And the next best step, next to best step to follow is Jesus Christ. So church, I want to encourage you. Um, to think through what your next step is. That's not going to look the same for all of us. We have our three E's, embrace, equip, engage. For you, that, might, that next step might be to embrace the Lord, to embrace him as your savior. It might be to embrace him in trust, to start to open up those white-knuckled, clenched fists and say, God, I trust you with this. It, it might be that you need equipped. Maybe, maybe you need to get involved in, in our small group ministry. Maybe you need to get involved in, in some of our Bible studies. Maybe you need to start getting discipled one-on-one. -on -one. Come talk to me. Come talk to uh, Dennis and Stephen. We'd love to sit down with you and, and create a path for you to begin to be discipled and begin or, or grow in your walk with Jesus. Maybe it's engagement. Maybe you just need to have brothers and sisters around you that can encourage you, that can pick you up, that can exhort you a little bit, challenge you, push you, call you out when you are walking off of the path. Maybe, maybe it's that God saying, hey, guess what? You need, to, you need to start to think beyond yourself. Think about your neighbors across the street or right next door. Think about those people in other places who don't have the word in their own language. Now, are you going to be able to translate? I, maybe you got that gift. I don't have that gift, but I know people who do, and we can come alongside them. So I'd encourage you, Nate and Valor here for another week. I'd encourage you, we have a potluck right now, like right afterwards. I'm going to pray for the food, and then like we can rush in there and, and get, some, get some good food together and fellowship together. So you, you have no excuse, like there's no reason to go out the, white, the glass doors. You can just stick around. Hang out, get to know Nate and Val, talk to them. I'd encourage you to join in their ministry, join with Wycliffe, partner with them. Um, you, can, you can be in their prayer ministry, you can be in their financial assistance um, help. And, and so I'd just encourage you, they got a table right out here, connect with them, join with them. Uh, we really love the, the work that Wycliffe is doing and we love to, to come alongside Nate and Val in that. So if you would, would you just pray with me real quick? We'll pray for the food and the potluck, and uh, you have a, as much time as you want to fellowship. Heavenly Father, we are so grateful. We're so thankful for the work that you do in us. Your, your insignificant, broken, imperfect vessels that you choose to use for your glory, for your gospel, for your kingdom. Father, we just pray 
for Nate and Val and the kiddos. We just pray, Lord, that you would continue to use them in mighty ways, that you would continue to encourage them and uplift them and bring alongside other brothers and sisters to support them. Father, we're thankful for the work that, that you're doing through Wycliffe and translating your word into every single language that you created from Babel on. God, you say that you will not return until um, the, the word has been preached to the ends of the earth. And so, Lord, we seek to see that ministry accomplished so that we can see you face to face. Father, we pray that you'd bless our conversations today, bless our fellowship and our time as your church being your church, loving one another well. Because when we love one another well, then the world sees and they will know that you and you alone are God. Would you bless our food, bless our conversation. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.